So last summer, I'm at Pier 39 in San Francisco, and I'm leaning on the rail, looking at some seals, and there's a guy standing next to me, leaning on the rail, and he has a Braves jacket on, like one of those really nice leather ones. I mean, I, it was like a very nice, very expensive jacket. And, and so I decided to make conversation. I said, so, you know, are you from Atlanta? He said, yeah, I live in Roswell. I said, well, yeah, I'm, you know, from Forsyth County. And he's like, oh, huh, you know, and, and I said, well, do you like the Braves? He said, oh, yeah, I love the Braves. I'm a big fan. I said, well, what do you think of the new stadium? He said, well, I really haven't had a chance to, to go yet. I said, well, have you been watching them on TV? No, I, I never watch them on TV. I said, well, I said, you know, I think they're doing great. You know, Freddie's finally got some help, and Albies is the best young second baseman in the game, and Acuna, he's just hitting the cover off the ball. And he looked at me, and it was obvious he had no idea what I was talking about. And it was then that I realized that he's not a true fan. Because real fans go to the games, or they at least watch the team on TV, or they know what's going on, they know who the players are, they know what's happening in the organization, the dynamics around, around the team, and they love talking about that stuff. He didn't even want to talk about it. But a real fan is really into it. And it was obvious that he liked being associated with the Braves. He liked being identified with the Braves, or he wouldn't wear, like, some $500 Braves leather jacket. But he wasn't really into the Braves. And there's a lot of Christians that are like that. They like being identified with Jesus. They like being associated with Jesus, but they're really not that into Jesus. You know, they may self-identify as a Christian on social media. They may attend church, you know, once a month or twice a month on a, on a really good month. They may even have some sort of a Christian, you know, insignia on the back of their car. They may have a t-shirt from a Christian band. But they're really not into Jesus. And our churches are sometimes filled with people who are really just not that into Jesus. Because when you're into Jesus, it changes you. Like, you think different. You live different. You know, you, you pursue Him. You long for His presence. You, you desire to be conformed to His person. You seek out His Word. You seek out His ways. You seek out His kingdom. You know, His ways are wonderful uh, to us. You know, His Word is life. You know, such people don't simply identify with Jesus. Jesus is their identity. He is their life. And they live for Him. And Colossians chapter 2 talks about this. And I'm going to be reading from verses 6 and 7, which is in the middle. And just go ahead and leave that up there, Claudia, the whole time. Uh, but it's, it's in the middle, so you'll figure out uh, where I'm at. But it, but it reads like this. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So, let's see if we can get big picture here. Uh, for just a second. So Colossians chapter 2 has two primary themes. That our salvation is complete. That we don't need anything more than Christ. And that our discipleship is critical. That we need to grow in Christ. And we, we talked about the first theme last week. When we talked about how we have fullness in Christ and and we don't need anything other than Christ. We have everything that, that we need in Him. And this was a continuation of the theme from chapter 1 of the supremacy and preeminence in Christ. That if, that if Christ is everything that the Bible says that He is, what more do we possibly need than Him? He can secure our salvation. And so, a new 
narrative, or a new theme is introduced to the narrative here. Not only is our salvation complete, but uh, our discipleship is, is critical. And the idea here is just as the supremacy and the preeminence of Christ secures our salvation, so too does it lead to a rich and full spiritual life in Christ. The supremacy and preeminence of Christ changes how we live. Verse 6, just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live in Him. Verses 9 and 10, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form and you have been given fullness in Christ. In verses 2 and 3, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the tr- uh, all uh, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so we see this idea of fullness just being repeated in chapter 2. And early in chapter 2, you know, we are to have fullness in Christ, fullness in the, in the treasures of his, of his riches and knowledge. And the idea here is that if Christ is truly who he says he is, and now remember, this is a carryover from chapter 1 where it reads, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, if all of this is true, then true life is found in and through him. In fact, if all of this is true, Life is found nowhere else. And it is our honor, our privilege, our desire, our passion to lay our lives before Him and to live for Him. We are no longer satisfied with the trappings of Christianity. We will only settle for Christ Himself. For He is our life. He is our God. He is our goal. He is our everything. And so the question becomes, do we want this? Do we really desire to live in and through and for Christ? And if we do, well then how exactly do we do this? Well remember the second theme that is being introduced here into chapter 2. Our discipleship is critical. And what Paul is saying here is that it is critical that we grow in Christ so that we can experience the fullness of Christ. So that we can live in and through and for Him. And Paul gets very specific on how we do this. And he starts here in verses 6 and 7 by talking about faith and gratitude. And then, for the remainder of the chapter, he talks about right thinking. And then in chapter 3, he talks about right living. And we will get to those later. But today, we want to focus on verses 6 and 7, where he talks about faith and thanksgiving. Because he's kind of creating these as two anchors. Two pillars upon which he is going to build this Christian ethic of experiencing fullness in Christ by growing in Him that we might experience everything that He is. And so He starts out this this theme of discipleship, this theme of growing in Christ, by emphasizing these two things, being strengthened in faith and overflowing with thanksgiving. And so in Paul's mind, faith and thanksgiving are absolutely key. That if we're going to grow in Him and experience His fullness, then that's important. And so let's start by talking about faith. He says... He encourages them to be strengthened in faith. Now, remember the goal. The goal is Christ. He is our life. 
We, you know, we live for him. You know, we want him. We long for his presence. We desire to conform to his person. We desire his word, his will, and his kingdom. And none of this happens without faith. So if you don't genuinely believe that God is real, you're not going to long for his presence. If you don't sincerely believe that he is the sovereign creator and ruler of heaven and earth, you have no real incentive to conform your life to his purposes. If you don't believe that he is the author of life, that he is the the source and sustainer of all things that are life, you're not going to seek his word or his will or, or his ways. You know, what we believe about God will translate into our lives and it will impact how we live. And there's a lot of us who believe in our own minds that we have a very high opinion of God. But our actions say different. So, there's this episode of this show called Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And she and a friend attend this this very sophisticated art exhibit at a very exclusive, swanky gallery in, in, in New York City. And everybody's very pretentious. And they, they, they pretend that they like all of this, this abstract art that, honestly, to myself, and I think most people, it, it, it doesn't look like art. It looks like a kindergartner found some leftover paint and threw it on a canvas, and voila, you have very expensive art. And, uh, and people are just falling all over themselves to wax eloquent about, oh, the, the, the way they use color and, and light. And, and then they, you know, the, and, and they're just falling all over themselves to, to pay tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, to own a piece of the trendiest art in New York City. Now, Midge, who's the main character in the show, she doesn't get it. And she's bored. She's walking around like, I, I don't understand any of this. I don't, I don't see what, what these people find so attractive about this, this art. And, and so she wanders into a back room. And in the back room, there's all these paintings on the wall, but there's nobody in there except a woman who's bored as can be reading a book. And so she's looking in there, and she sees an actual picture. There's a woman sitting in a chair. And she likes the picture, and she looks at it for a while, and then she looks at some of the others, but she keeps going back to that picture. And so finally, she points at the picture, and she looks at the woman, and she says, how much for the picture? And the woman doesn't even look up. She goes, $25. And she goes, huh. She points at another picture. How much for that one? $25. So then she doesn't even look at any picture. She just looks at the woman and she goes, how much for this one? And the woman goes, $25. And the idea is that these are the least desirable, the least valuable paintings in the entire gallery. In fact, when the woman says, you know, $25, she's just dripping with contempt. Like her words are just, you know, oh, I can't believe that that you would even ask. I can't believe that anyone would desire any of the paintings that are in this room. It's like the overflow room, kind of like, you know, the, I don't know, the, you know, the bargain basement room or something like that. But Midge likes the painting. And so she pays her $25 and she has the painting of the woman sitting in a chair and then she goes back out wherever all the, the fancy people are mingling and, you know, demonstrating how knowledgeable they are. And they're all just kind of looking at her like, ugh. And finally, the most avant-garde artist in the entire city, the most exclusive artist in the entire city, walks up to her and he's almost challenging her. And he says, why did you buy that painting? And she said, well, I liked it. He said, well, why did you like it? And she says, I don't know. it's like the woman has a secret that that nobody knows, which is actually one of the themes of the show. She's a comic in the 50s, and women comics were not a thing back then, and so she was keeping it secret from her family, and so she identified with the woman. And so she strikes up a conversation with this artist, and he invites her and a friend to his gallery, which nobody does, because he's very private and very edgy and, you know, misanthropic. You know, he doesn't like people. He's, he's just this, this person, you know, but he invites her there, which is like this big thing. Everybody's like, oh, 
you know, ooh, she got to go. And, and so he finds an excuse to get rid of her friend, and, and then he takes her into a secret room. And in the secret room that nobody knows about, it's like secret way to get in and everything, unveils this huge painting. And it's her painting, the woman in the chair. And he says, this is my masterpiece. And she's amazed. She's, she's, her breath is taken away. And, and, and she's like, well, why don't you show this to people? It's so beautiful. He says, I poured my soul into this painting. It's not for them. It's for me. And she said, well, why did you show it to me? He says, because you get it. You understand. He said, they don't get it. So they're not worthy of the privilege of seeing it. And so it turns out that Midge actually purchased the most valuable exclusive painting in the entire exhibit. If the other people had known, they would have paid hundreds of thousands, you know, maybe, maybe more, you know, for that particular picture. Because this guy was so avant-garde, he wouldn't even sell his art. Like, if you could actually find a piece of his art out there for sale, then you really, really had something. And so, you know, she is... Well, the whole thing demonstrates something. That's where I want to go. That people will chase after garbage if they think it's valuable. And they will ignore that which is of true value if they believe it to be common. And it's such a, a narrative, it's such a commentary on society today. You know, we chase after all this worthless stuff while ignoring Christ because we don't believe that Christ and his kingdom has any value. And, and it's not about what we say we believe. It's not about, you know, what we put on the bumper sticker or on our Facebook page about our associations and our affiliations and all of that kind of stuff. It's about what your life says about who you are. And so what does your life say about what you believe about God? Like, do you... Do you genuinely pursue Christ? Do you genuinely seek Him? Do you desire His Word? Do you desire His kingdom? Does it make a difference in your life? Does it make a difference in how you live? Or are you simply satisfied with the trinkets of Christianity? Of just saying, I'm just associated with Christ. In other words, you know, are you a true fan in the sense of the illustration, you know, that I get? Because there's a guy who wrote a book, not a fan, because everybody's a fan of Christ, and, you know, you need to be more than that. But, you know, you know, do you talk a good game, or, you know, are you really into Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you desire Jesus? And so Paul talks about this, being strengthened in faith, because... As we're strengthened in faith that we genuinely believe He's who He is, then we want to know Him. Like, if you really believe there's a God, and like the image of God that I read during the, the welcome time, you know, God in heaven on His throne, it's like, man, you, like Isaiah, you can't do anything except just bow prostrate before Him and to live for Him and to give your life to Him. And if you're not doing that, what does that say about what you believe in God? and what you believe about God. And so he talks about faith. The second thing that Paul talks about here is one of the pillars, like if we're going to grow in faith and we're going to establish this, this relationship with, with Christ so that we can experience the richness and the fullness of Christ, the other pillar is this idea of thankfulness. Now I'm convinced that as a movement in America, I'm talking about Christianity, that we are not nearly as Christian as we think we are. And the reason is because we don't emphasize the things that Christ emphasized. We don't emphasize the things that, that the Scriptures emphasize. Things like righteousness and mercy and peace and thankfulness. The Bible, I don't know if you've, like, if you've read the Bible. I hope you have. If you've read it, like, if you start looking for it, you see thankfulness everywhere. Thanksgiving everywhere. It, it is to be one of the, the 
things that characterize us as believers. Like when people see us, they, they should be like, man, that's a grateful person. That, that, that's, a, that's a thankful person. For example, it's very much emphasized in the book of Colossians. In fact, Paul emphasizes it in every single chapter in Colossians. Let me, let me show you what I mean. And verses 1, or, or chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Chapter 2, verse 7, overflowing with thankfulness. What we're talking about here. Chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you teach, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. Chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful. I was talking with Glenn Trimble, who I don't mean to put on the spot, a couple months ago about this idea of thankfulness. And I thought he had some really interesting observations. So I'm going to steal some of Glenn's observations, not claim them as myself, because I'm real sensitive to that sort of thing. Uh, but Glenn made this comment. He said that as human beings, especially in our particular society, we have this tendency to remember the bad and forget the good. And he calls this missing tile syndrome. And he says, so, so say you walk into a room. It's a beautiful room. And it's warm and comfortable and it looks like something on TV. You're, you, you know, the kind of room where you think to yourself, man, I would love to have a room like that. I would love to be able to spend time in a room like that. But let's say you, you walk into that, to that room and there's a huge tile missing in the middle of the floor. He said, what happens? He says, your eye immediately goes to the missing tile. And you fixate on the missing tile. And later, when you think about the room, what comes to mind? The missing tile. Not all of the other great things about the room. Those are all kind of secondary now because that, you, you, that's what pops into your head. Yeah, remember that really great room? Yeah, it had, that was the one with the missing tile. And in this way, we kind of remember the bad and, and, and not the good. And, and he said this is because we have this tendency uh, to, to remember that which makes an impression on us. And we live in a society where it is getting more and more difficult to make an impression, especially in things that are good, because we are numb to the good. And the reason is, is because our society, the media, TV, movies, and especially like television commercials and magazine ads and all that kind of stuff, they idealize everything. Social media, people idealize everything. Uh, everybody on Facebook lives a perfect life. And then you're there thinking, you know, man, my life just is not the same. And so, you know, we watch Downton Abbey. We watch Star Wars. We watch Stranger Things. And our lives just seem so ordinary. And even when, when good things happen to us, I mean, in comparison, they're really not all that special. And so in this way... We don't even really see the good, much less remember the good, because we're fixated on the things that we don't have and, and the things that aren't working. And then society does a really great job of reinforcing all of that stuff because that's how they sell products, right? Oh, man, you're really missing out. You don't have this, and, and you don't have this thing over there, and, and it's not fair. This is all the ways that life is not fair, and, and these are you know, all the, the, the bad things that are happening to you that you need to rectify because that's how our society works. That's how the market works. Folks, we live in the most affluent county in Georgia, one of the most affluent counties in the United States, which is one of the most affluent countries in the world. And I know it's not true for all of us, but for the overwhelming majority of us, honestly, what else do we really need? You know, what are, like, what are we really lacking from a, from a global perspective, from a historical perspective, as far as our lifestyle is concerned? <laughs> Like, like what, what do we really need? And, and again, from a monetary perspective, from a lifestyle perspective, 
You know, how much suffering have, have, have most of us, you know, really encountered? The truth is, is that Jesus has delivered us from that which is truly bad and that which is truly evil. And none of that is our, ourselves. Like, we didn't have anything to do with it. We didn't earn it. Through His grace and His death on the cross, He has given us salvation, and He has given us new life in Christ. And as Christians, as believers in Christ, we should realize this and live lives of continuous gratitude. We should focus on the good and not the bad. And it has tremendous impact in our spiritual lives. So if we focus on the bad, all we're doing is thinking about all of the things we don't have. All of the ways that, that we suffer, how, how just hard life is for us, and, and, and you know all this stuff that society just bombards us with all the time. Guys, that has to erode your faith, almost by definition. It just chips away, chips away, chips away. Because, you know, at some point, if not consciously, subconsciously, we're like, yeah, God, why aren't you hooking me up? Why aren't you taking care of this? Why aren't you taking care of that? Why, you know, why aren't you giving me this thing over here that all these people on social media have? How come my life isn't as good as theirs? How come my life isn't as good as these people on TV? How come my life isn't as exciting as, as all of these other things that happen? My life's so boring, it's so ordinary, it's so mundane. It just erodes our faith because we begin to question God why we don't have everything we think we should have. But if we look for the good and we look at what God is doing and we look at all that we do have and how God has blessed us beyond measure and for us in this room, and it could not be said everywhere in the world, most places in the world for that matter, but for most of us in this room, He's not only blessed us spiritually with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, He has blessed us materially as well. So what are we lacking? Glenn mentioned his boss. He said, I work for a truly grateful man. And he said it changes everything about the atmosphere in the office because he's not angry He's not bitter. He's not cynical. He's not petty. He's not mean. He said he genuinely is aware of the good that's going on around him. He's aware of the good in people's lives. He's aware of the good of what's happening in the company. And, and he said it, it just changes his mood. And we all know the boss's mood means a lot. Like the whole tone of the office can go by the boss's mood. He said it changes his outlook and his sense of optimism. It changes his relationships. It changes everything when you change that one thing. Just about how you relate. Guys, before we conclude, I just a little sidebar. I, I want to challenge you to confront missing tile syndrome in your life. If you're determined to find the bad in a situation, you can do it. But I'm convinced, in fact, more convinced, that if you're determined to find the good, then you can do it. And the reason is, is because the good is everywhere. And God is working everywhere and moving everywhere. And yes, bad things happen to us. I don't mean to minimize that. I don't mean to minimize your, your individual situation. I'm just saying, all things considered, we are a blessed people. And if we stop and open our eyes, you know, we will see that. It's just that we have been so conditioned to see the bad and remember the bad and, and not the good and not, and not the blessing. And that's not who we are. We've been given Christ. We've been given a kingdom. We don't live that way. We're a, we are a people as a people who are aware of the good and live grateful lives. And that makes a huge difference. So, let's bring it all back. Let's connect the dots for, for just a second as we close. So here's Paul. He's making the transition in the letter. So, 
So there's, there's flow in, in, in what he's trying to accomplish in his argument. And for the first chapter and a half, he's talking about how we have uh, our, our salvation is complete in Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. All the fullness of the deity dwells in him. And our salvation is grounded and rooted in him. We don't need anything else. We don't need any of this paganism that's out there. We don't need any of this legalism that's out there. We don't need any of that. It is in Christ grounded and rooted in him. So that's the first chapter and a half. The second two and a half chapters, he says, okay, that has lifestyle implications. And it is that we can experience fullness in Christ. We can experience the fullness of everything that he is as the image of the invisible God, all the fullness of the deity in him, everything. He has a life for us that is out of this world, but we have to grow in him. Our discipleship is critical. We need to grow in understanding. We need to grow in knowledge, all of that stuff. And he says, before I get into all that, I'm going to talk about right thinking, right theology, and then I'm going to talk about right living, and all that's discipleship. He said, but before I do that, I want to lay a foundation. And there's two things that we need to cover. He says, you need to be strengthened in, in faith, and you need to be overflowing in thankfulness. Desire and attitude. Right? Faith. If we genuinely believe He is who He says He is, if we genuinely believe what He says in, in Colossians 1, 15 to 20, how can we not seek Him? How can we not want that? That gives us the desire. That gives us the passion to know God. If your faith is weak, you're not going to seek God. You're not going to care. But as you grow in faith, as you're strengthened in faith, how can you not seek Him? How can you not want to just lay your life before Him, want to give your life to Him? So he says faith is key because it brings us desire. And then the second thing is attitude. Thankfulness. People who are thankful are enthusiastic. They're optimistic. So if we understand who Christ is and then all that He brings to the table and all that He's doing in our lives, it's hard not to get excited about, about the Lord. It's hard not to, to wonder, man, I wonder what He's going to do next. You know, I, I want to know Him more. I want to seek Him. Because we have a very positive attitude. If we have a very, if we're not great, what, what's the opposite, opposite of gratitude? Like, I guess, ingratitude. But just not even unaware. Just, just ignoring all of the good things that God does in your life. Taking, taking the Lord for granted. How much are you going to want to grow in Him? How much are you going to want to seek Him? You know, if you're just one of those negative people, I, I realize I'm getting old. Because I say all these things that nobody gets anymore, like for back from when I was a kid. Like those of you over 50 remember Glum from Gulliver's Travels. Remember that cartoon? And there was that guy, he'd sit around and go, it'll never work, it'll, you know, and, and he just brought everybody down. You know, that guy is not going to seek the Lord because the attitude's all wrong. And so desire, faith, attitude, thankfulness. And as we grow in those, it, it's a foundation for us to begin building the right thinking and the right living and those other things. But without those two things, without faith, it just, it just kind of crumbles. Without gratitude, and I know we don't talk about gratitude a lot um, you know, in, in the church today and how important it is, but without that, that thankfulness, being thankful for the Lord in everything. You know, without that, again, we're going to be too depressed or too down or too whatever. We're, we're, we're not going to have that motivation to really seek Him as we do when we realize all of the good things that He's doing in our lives. When we are self-aware spiritually to understand how blessed we really are. And if we get it, we're like, wow, He really is the source of life. 
I'm going to seek Him. I'm going to want to know more of Him. I'm going to dig into His Word. I'm going to seek His ways. I'm going to want to be obedient. Not because it's my duty, but because I understand that obedience is a source of blessing. I'm going to want to know Him. And so as we begin this journey now, so we basically kind of ended that first part of Colossians. So there's two primary movements until he starts like greeting all his friends, like, hey, you know, say hi to so-and-so, you know. Um, But there's the two major theological movements, you know, so we're we're making that transition. And so from this point on, we're going to start talking about what it means to grow in Christ, what it means to be a disciple. And he's going to talk about the ways that we need to think, the way our mind needs to work, the perspective that we need to have. We've got to remember that all of that is built on faith and thankfulness. And then we're going to talk about right living. And it's going to blow your mind. The things the Bible emphasizes blows our mind. And it's not all the things that we think about with right living. The first thing he starts with, compassion, gentleness, those types of things. Awesome. So we're going to get there. But it's built on faith and thankfulness. You don't have those two things, you can't do the rest of the stuff that he's talking about in the book. You can try, and you might get some progress, make some progress, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work the way that it's supposed to work. And so of all people, we need to be a people of faith. And we need to be people who are aware of the good and live grateful lives. And that will make a huge difference, not only in how we relate to other people, but in how we relate to God. Let's pray.